Okay, um, now we get on to the, um, the question that was posted on page 7. Um, now, this is regarding lecture 6, um, page number 23. Why theta we receive should be equal to theta revenue plus interest? I do not understand the interest part. Um, Okay, let's have a look at lecture six, page twenty-three. Okay, uh, now this is actually regarding um, this is page twenty-three. Uh, it's a it's a, a put call parity question where you are long, you are long puts and you are short some calls, and um, the. Um, so this is uh, actually equivalent to um, a short, short selling position, um, shorting the forward. Um, now there are different ways uh, you can actually look at um, a combination like that. Um, you can look, you can look at this as a um, as a long put, short call package or you can actually look at it uh, from the point of view of a futures contract. So, if you are long the future con futures contract, um, it would, of course, the future first of all is equal to the um, the spot price plus the um, the interest that you pay on the spot between now and and maturity. Um, so, if you are if you are short the future. Which in this case you are, then the the um, the position is opposite. Now, the thing is, when you just looking at it like this, um, there are two things I can say. So first of all, um, purely looking at it from the um, interest cost point of view, if you are long the future, uh, then with every day that passes. Uh, this is the interest on the spot between the you know the day to day uh, now and also at expiry. So with every day that passes, uh, the interest will drop, and as a result, uh, the value of the future will drop. If if the spot stays the same, that's the whole point. Okay. So if you are long the future, you're not really so happy uh, to see that nothing happens at all and time is just ticking away if you are long the future okay you're not really so happy uh, with, with with the passage of time now here the, the case is you are short you are short the future so you are actually quite happy and it is in fact possible to quantify that happiness because every day uh, actually, if it's three hundred, if it's three point six five percent per annum, so every day it's actually one basis point. If you are short something, and the the the, the price of something keeps going down, okay, that's that's what you want to see, and that's what's happening here. Um, so that uh, change in value uh, purely because of time passing by uh, is. Um, you could you could call that theta, um, even though uh, in this instance, uh, strictly speaking, if you think of the long put and the short call um, as being the parity equivalent of the futures contract, then then this so-called theta is nothing more than uh, the, the change in the futures price. Now, there happens to be um, another interesting element. Um, you are actually short gamma according to the example um, you're short a thousand gamma and um, as a result you're actually compensated for that um, with the formula a half gamma uh, sigma s o squared so normally if you are long call and short the put uh, with the same strike um, gamma you know in theory should be zero um, the fact that you are short must mean that the put and the call gamma are not exactly the same. Um, so you have to account for that as well. Okay. 
So you, when you have a, uh, in this case, a um, a long put and short call. So the first thing you can do, the first thing you can do is think of it um, in 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 terms of how a futures contract might behave, um, and then and then, okay, if you are gamma neutral, then you will just stop at that. If you're not gamma neutral, then you 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 consider the um, the, the, the gamma dimension in addition. Okay. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to have a look at a uh, question that was on page page eight. Uh, this is concerning lecture number seven, uh, page nine. Why the value of put will be the cost of early exercise of call? Um, now the lecture. Lecture seven, page nine, looks like this. Um, this is actually um, something that I touched upon um, yesterday, November twenty. Um, if you care to look at um, the uh, the tutorials that I have put together, um, the one for yesterday near the end, there are some pages uh, where I try to outline the circumstance under which you will exercise an American an American option. Um, and in this case, we are talking about um, an American call. Now, we are not saying we are not saying that the benefit of exercising calls is equal to the cost of doing so. Um, so once again, uh, this whole discussion of whether you exercise an American call earlier or not um, is actually uh, an opportunity cost argument. Okay, let me try and find the. Um, so whether you exercise early, it's it's actually. Um, the discussion here is based upon, uh, along the lines of exercising the call and actually replacing that with a long stock and long put position. Okay, so if you're long the stock and you are long a put, it would be uh, you know similar to being long a call. So the discussion is: shall I keep the call or shall I actually um, exercise it? get the stocks and buy a put in. So it's a comparative analysis, in other words, okay? So we, we are never saying that these are the same, but if you exercise a call and you get the shares, you do benefit from that because you will get paid a dividend, if there is a dividend, uh, between now and expiry, okay? If there is not a dividend, this discussion does not even take place, but if there is a dividend, um, and you, uh, and let's say this is now, and this is expiry of your call option, and uh, there's a dividend getting paid here. If you do not exercise your call, you do not get paid a dividend, okay? But if you exercise and, and you become a legal shareholder, then you get paid a dividend. Now, if you exercise a call, you get the shares and you buy a put then there are costs involved, okay? So first of all, we assume that in a sort of zero uh, zero financing um, environment, um, then um, so the costs involved are uh, from a legal, uh, sorry, I got distracted, from a legal point of view, um, if you if you have no money, so you have to borrow money to buy the stocks when you exercise the call when the stocks are delivered to you. So you borrow money uh, and you pay interest. Okay, that's cost number one. Cost number two is you now buy the put. Okay, so the whole argument of whether you should exercise the call or not is comparing, am I better off keeping the call uh, or am I better off exercising the call and, and therefore, I get these benefits, but I also get these costs. So that's the benefit. And if the benefit is greater than the cost, then I will exercise. Okay? So that's all there is to it.
Okay, now we uh, take a look at um, uh, the question posted on page 9, uh, which concerns lecture number 4, page 28. Uh, the question is, for large scalps, why days when you will not trade matter uh, when you optimize gamma hedging and for small scalps, what is the opportunity cost on big moves? Okay, um, let's just go to uh, lecture 4, page 28 for, uh, for a quick moment. Um, so lecture, lecture 4. Lecture 4, page 28. Um, now, actually, this is um, this discussion is um, uh, really it's about this. So you all know what scalping is, okay? And that is, you are you are long you are long an option. Uh, therefore, you are long gamma, and you delta hedge it, so that no matter whether the market goes up or down, you will make money. And if it goes up, you make this amount. And if it goes down, you make this amount. Now, it's, this sounds like it's fantastic. Okay, it's um, it's so simple that you know a monkey can do it practically. So you you must be thinking, why don't we all just go out and do it? Okay. Um, you know why? Why go to college? Um, the answer is, you got to pay for it. There is a cost. Okay, so if there is a a move from here to here of let's say delta s, as you know very well, um, what you get to scalp is a half times gamma, and you are long gamma. Okay, times delta s. Okay, but there's uh, sorry the square of delta s. But there's also um, there's a price to pay, uh, which is equal to which is the theta, okay, uh, which you can calculate, and the formula is a half times gamma times sigma s all square. So if these two are actually equal, okay, um, what you get to scalp uh, will be offset by the time decay, the the the, the price of the option slowly. Drifting to um, to to zero, for example, if you are just at the money. Um, so when you are uh, when you have a position like this and uh, nothing happens for a day, okay, um, it actually will hurt you um, because you are paying you are, you are paying theta. Uh, so so the, the 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 choice is this. So let's say there are there are two two different stocks you're looking at, and one of them doesn't really do a lot, but when it moves, it really jumps around. Okay, that's one of them, and there's another. So let's call this stock A, and this one stock B. Okay, and there's another one which never would move the way that A does, but it just does a little bit up and down, up and down, up and down, and maybe maybe there's a trend. It doesn't matter. Okay. But it's always kind of stable and well behaved and little move, little bits of movements, but frequent and regular movements. So the question is, if you were thinking of, you know, trying to make money um, by going long option and long gamma and long vega and then delta hedging, which stock is better for you? Okay, so if you want to go down here. Okay, so these are called large scalps. Wow, these are wonderful. This is exactly what you want. But please remember, these don't happen every day. And when they don't happen, uh, when 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 you are let's say here, and and it's very very boring and it doesn't go anywhere, uh, then you you are actually paying for it, and, and and there's no there's no action, and you will be losing money. Okay, now. The other scenario is, let's say you don't want to do this, and then you do, you don't want to just hang around and 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 wait for your luck to turn, and you prefer to have sort of constant little movements. Okay, then the thing is, uh, you you have opportunity cost. That means you will not 
be able to capitalize on the big movements of something else, uh, because you're going to miss it. Okay. So if you choose, if you choose B, then then the the the, uh, the, the disadvantage is that if something happens to A, uh, then you're going to miss it. Okay. And if you choose A, then the um, the disadvantage is when nothing happens here. Okay, at the beginning, then you are just paying for nothing. Uh, whereas for B, at least you are getting some sort of income. So there's always um, a kind of trade-off. Okay, now you must be thinking, well, what I want is a stock that sort of does this. So some regular movements and sometimes does this. Okay, now of course you do. Okay, what we are saying is. In the absence of that, okay, everybody would want to see a stock like that, and the, the theta would be very expensive, by the way. This one, okay. The discussion here is, in the absence of that, if you really are confronted with a choice between A and B, okay, assuming that you can predict their patterns, assuming you can, okay, which one would you choose? Okay, that's what this discussion、uh, is all about. Okay. Okay.、Um, I like to have a go at、um, this question,、uh, which is on page page ten,、um, and it's regarding lecture four,、um, page thirty eight.、Um, according to the second graph for ATM options, low volatility options and high volatility options have almost the same gamma. Why? Because I think that. Vega is the condensed future gamma revenue, and high volatility generates high gamma revenue.、Uh, Vega should be higher for high volat higher volatility options.、Um, well, what a question!、Um, I I really like this question. I don't know who asked this question.、Um, if you are listening,、um, I would really like you to send me an email and identify yourself.、Um, Excellent point.、Um, so let's actually have a look at the、um, the graph. I think the student is referring to this graph here. Why is it that?、Uh, okay, what is this graph? First of all,、um, it's how Vega will change when the share price is changing for a given option,、um, assuming that the strike is some is 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 fifty. Um, there are a number of things you can observe.、Um, so、first of all,、um, when the option is at the money, that is when the vega is at a maximum.、Um, for low volatility or high volatility option, that 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 shouldn't come as a surprise. It's just saying that when an option is at the money,、um, the optionality is at a maximum. It is true around around this area here. Okay, compared to let's say here, of course, it's 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 thicker. Okay, so the thicker it is,、uh, the you know the the more optionality you have. Now,、um, the thing is, the question is, why is it that for a low vol option and a high vol option, the vegas are roughly the same?、Um, if you Go back to the question.、Um, I think since Vega is condensed future gamma, well, I would. You are nearly correct, except I would say Sigma is the condensed future revenue,、um, which is the uh, direct uh, consequence of this formula here.、Uh, so, if you have a high Sigma. So you are likely to get much more gamma revenue in the future. So that is absolutely correct. Now, Vega, Vega is actually a measure of how the price of an option change when volatility itself is changing. Okay, so it's saying,、uh, you know, if you have an option which started like this.、Um, So first of all, you 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 actually make you make you make and only make money when there is a lot of movement up and down. But you do also make money 
when when volatility goes up because that's when the option um, you know it sort of elevates and you, you you pick up a bit more extra value when the option moves up here but it's nowhere near as much as when there's a lot of movement now I think there are there are um, two uh, quick explanations that I can offer you um, the um, or we can look at it in three ways so first of all let me verify let me just quickly verify that um, for options that are at the money uh, the Vega doesn't change very much when you change the volatility I think a lot of students uh, frequently confuse uh, they think that since uh, gamma is high, then Vega should also be high. Okay, uh, so let me let me first of all just um, uh, go to the the uh, pricing page. So I'm gonna type. Uh, I'm gonna get uh, option option price dot com okay now just to verify to you uh, what I'm actually saying um, so what I have here is um, uh, let me just um, wipe out the interest rates and the dividend so you have an option which is priced at um, for, for 30 days um, and underlying price 100 exercise price 100 volatility 25 and the the Vega is a point one one four right now now if I was to change this to 35 uh, and then reprice the Vega doesn't really change at all okay it's not it's not a malfunction it just doesn't change um, 50 it doesn't move okay now there is I guess a um, uh, there is a mathematical explanation um, and there is um, an intuitive explanation um, the mathematical so first of all please uh, Vega I wouldn't say Vega is the condensed future camera I would say Sigma is the you know uh, actually hidden or embedded in sigma is all the, the future gamma that you are you are likely to get um, and it is true that high volatility generate high gamma I agree okay um, it doesn't mean that high Vega uh, now it doesn't mean high Vega will generate high gamma revenue um, if you if you look at, um, for example, on Sunday I was telling you there is a parameter called um, uh, D Vega, D Vol, uh, or D Vega, D Sigma, if you like. Vol. When I say Vol, I mean Sigma. Now this is a, I said to you this was called Vanna. It's not called Vanna. It's called Volga. Okay, Volga. Um, this is measuring how uh, Vega will change when volatility changes. Now, this would actually answer your question. Okay, should Vega change a lot when volatility changes? Now, Volga, um, not to be mistaken from vulgar, okay, which means you know very crass and very impolite and. Uh, very uncultured. This is this is Volga, V O G B O L G A. Um, it's actually um, e to the minus Q T uh, multiplied by T, and then it's a uh, n dash D one, uh, and then I think the formula is uh, D one D two uh, divided by sigma. Now this is a direct result of um, just differentiating the Vega formula uh, one more time with respect to um, 
to sigma itself. Now, what is n dash d1? Um, n dash d1 uh, is actually equal to um, the exponential of uh, minus uh, d1 square divided by 2 um, multiplied by uh, two, 1 over 2 pi. Okay, now don't worry too much about the formula, but what I, and then what, what is, um, what is D1? Okay, because you asked this question, I want to satisfy your curiosity, but I doubt whether in the exam, okay, so even if you don't fully comprehend this, it, it's okay. So D1 is the log of S uh, over K, uh, and then it's R minus Q plus uh, sigma square over 2 uh, times t uh, all divided by sigma square root of t okay now the first thing I can point out is why is it that when an option is at the, at the money um, at the money spot then the uh, the vega is at the highest and uh, notice this n dash d1 term here this term uh, is equal to e to the minus uh, d1 square so whatever d1 is uh, when you take the square and you put a minus sign in front of it um, it will always be some kind of a discount function um, in other words if this was d1 um uh it would when d1 is zero okay okay so the the x-axis is d1 when d1 is zero which is to say um no let me say it again uh when d1 has a value whether it's positive or negative you end up having a function which is e to the minus of that um, so it would it would always be uh, it would look like this okay regardless of whether d1 is positive or negative e to the minus d1 square will always be a slowly decaying function um, 1 over 2 pi doesn't have a role to play okay um, it's actually when d1 is very very small or close to zero um, that's when n dash d1 is at the highest and d1 is very very small when this term here disappears okay so d1 uh, is smallest when the log of s over k is equal to 0 in other words when when s is equal to k okay so that that we can figure out just by looking at this um, now the other thing is you can see that um, this d1 is also driven by there's a um, there's a sigma square term here and there's a there's a sigma here so overall um, it's driven by um, if you the, the two don't exactly cancel out of course okay but as uh, sigma increases uh, then as, as sigma increases um, it, it, it's going to affect the numerator and the denominator in different ways so for the denominator for the denominator it will it will rise uh, and for the numerator it will rise also but it's going to be divided by 2 okay so it's uh, altogether clear that and and don't forget this this d1 here is actually just embedded in uh, this formula here so it doesn't really have a very significant significant role to play uh, which is then embedded here okay um, the bottom line I guess is that uh, Sigma has a minimal uh, impact on Vega uh, when it's increasing um, now the intuitive way to think about this is um, when an option is at the money 
what it means is that there is an approximately 50% chance that you will make money and even if the option uh, or the underlying stock is very very volatile so your dispersion is a lot wider okay this one's not drawn very well so your dispersion is much wider than the one below uh, your chance of making money is still around 50 percent okay um, and as a result if 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 there's a, a sigma which is like 16 and there's another sigma here which is um, let's say 25 okay now if with with either option when you are at the money if the chance of you making money is still around 50 percent because it's this this shaded area here okay and intuitively you would think that um, you shouldn't pay more uh, for for the for the um, uh, no that's not what I mean no, actually you will you will pay more for this option um, I think the the um, the point here is do not confuse Sigma uh, which is a, a driver for the gamma revenue that you get um, with Vega okay now a, an option can have a very very high Sigma uh, which is like this one okay but it doesn't mean that Vega has to be high Vega can remain constant uh, for an option that is at the money so so the, the option price would increase it would increase it's just that it's increasing at a constant rate um, and the why the reason it does that is um, when you look at the Vega formula, um, which also involves the um, the n dash d one term, um, the part that is played by uh, the sigma here and the sigma here actually is not as significant as the driver here, the log of s over k. This is this is the one that's making the main contribution. Um, here you have a, a square, so it gets quite small. Um, and here it's down at the it's down at the bottom. Okay, so it's, it's mainly driven by by um, the log of s over k, uh, and that is the reason. Okay. Okay. For the next question, um, which is um, question on page eleven, now this is regarding lecture six. Um, page 13 the last Greek row I understand that when interest changes uh, the price of futures will change and according to the formula C minus P is equal to F minus X C minus P will change accordingly but why the total change is distributed to the call and put through Delta um, Okay, well, let's take a look at um, the actual page, uh, which I think this is lecture six. Um, now we know that we do we do know that um, when you long a call and short a put, um, it's equal to f minus x, and um, if you actually scroll forward um, a few more pages. Um, I think, and then it says the row of a synthetic is distributed between calls and puts. The thing is, you now have um, the right-hand side, uh, which is a practically a linear instrument uh, represented by uh, a composite package of long call and short put. And whatever interest rate sensitivity that this one experienced, because this one doesn't change, okay, whatever interest rate sensitivity um, uh, is exhibited by F has to come from the interest rate sensitivity of this one and this one. Now, when you are long a call and short a put, um, it's either, uh, you know, one of them can be worth a lot if this one is deep in the money and um, this one is deep out of the money okay or it could be the other way around this one is deep out the money this one is in the money okay um, of course it could be that both of them are at the money okay but let's just take a look at these situations now in that case 
if I was to tell you that um, the interest sensitivity of this interest rate sensitivity of F is the same as the interest rate sensitivity of long C and short P, then you can say, well, hold on a second. Um, if I'm long C and short P, uh, the interest rate sensitivity would come from the uh, the individual interest rate sensitivity of either C or P. Okay, and how are they sensitive? Well, it depends. If C is in the money, so C has a has a, has a very high delta, uh, then and P is practically worthless. Okay then the delta isn't really going to change very much uh, uh, when 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 the price is when, when interest rates are moving okay but most of the contribution will come from c okay now conversely if the um if the um the price of the underlying now now sinks uh to a very low level so so your option is deep in the money okay um then when interest rate changes uh your 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 futures price will change but most of the change will be coming from uh the change of value of the put option because the value of the call option is practically zero it doesn't really have a lot to change it doesn't have a lot of change to uh, to to give to you okay so that's why we say that when we try to predict um the change of a futures price because uh, of changing interest rate, in other words, the row, okay, we can tell where that change is coming from, the call or the put, simply by looking at which one is which one is actually the driver, okay. Um, if you don't even have much value, okay, then you don't have much to change, okay. That's that's really the point here. Okay. There's a question here. Um, this one is. Um, on page 12 um, I've been using optionprice.com to price 105 call and 95% uh, put uh, with a spot at 100 and no dividend or no interest why is there a price difference considering they have the same intrinsic value of negative 5 shouldn't they have the same gamma and same time value as well um well um there are several things i can say about that um so first of all we could try this uh so your your underlying price is um uh 100 and let's say you price a 95 put um and the the um Let's not use volatility 50. Let's say um, 25. Um, <clears throat> then what you get is the um, so now you have a 5% um, uh, uh, out of the money put. Now, if you were to price a call and the price is at 97 cents, and if you were to price a call at 105. Um, it's not quite the same. It's uh, it's now a dollar and eight cents. And the question is, why is that the case? Well, I can offer um, a few. Sort of intu one one is intuitive. Um, the first thing is when you buy when you buy a call, um, potentially your your gains are infinite. Uh, whereas when you buy a put, let's say with a strike of a hundred. Your your maximum gain is only a hundred, so they are not strictly symmetric. Um, there is a near symmetry, but it's not a perfect, precise symmetry. Um, a, a better a better clue is um, again, you know, I I say to you that uh, probably two of the um, most useful slides that I, I have given to you. One of them is uh, those graphs, um, the three the three graphs, and the other one um, would be these formulas that I provided to you uh, last time. Okay, so if you if you simply look at um, the price of an option, um, 
it involves the terms uh, d1 and d2 and here you have um, the log of uh, the spot price um, divided by k now the reason you don't have a perfect symmetry is that oops sorry uh, so log of s minus s over k um, so if you think of it like this so the log of um, 100 over 95 you compare that so this is s this is k okay with another option uh, where the strike was 105 and uh, the price is still the same um, these two are not the same they are not perfectly symmetric okay uh, not only that you you actually in your um, option pricing formula there are other there are other uh, parameters at play um, so you would never get a you would not get a perfect symmetry um, unless you start tweaking and, and, and adjusting the other parameters okay it's roughly symmetric okay but it's not precisely okay um, because there are other things hanging around okay which make it but it's mainly it's mainly because of that all right thank you for this question um, I'm wondering um, so I, I really um, I like uh, very much um, question 10 and 11 and 12 and I wonder whether they came from the same person um, so uh, the student or students who ask questions 10 11 and 12 uh, why don't you send me an email and let me know who you are it also uh, is proved that whether you are watching my videos or not okay all right thank you for this thank you very much